Good afternoon, Minnesota. I'm Governor Tim Walls. And during this unprecedented global pandemic of COVID-19, I'd like to take a few moments to just say thank you. Uh, I am grateful to be the governor of this great state. I'm grateful to be the neighbor of each and every one of you. Uh, what is being asked of you has not been asked of citizens before. Uh, and what you're doing is unprecedented in making a difference, not just in the lives of you and your family, but in others and, and folks that you don't even know. Uh, I wanna take some time today to talk about, update where the state is at, to fully flesh out for you where our plan is at, to try and provide a website portal with as up-to-date as information as that we have that are informing the decisions that we're making and the directions that we're going, and then the responses that Minnesotans are taking, both to the immediate threat of COVID-19 from a health perspective, and then looking to the future of recovery in the economic model. So by this point in time, it's been pretty obvious. It's been only 90 days since most of us became aware of COVID-19 at the end of December. And as we've seen the patterns across the world, it is burning hot through countries from China to Italy, Spain, uh, and now in the United States. And what we asked you to do when we first made early decisions was a couple of things that we can do to impact this. And one of those things was to slow the rate of infections by keeping social distancing. What that was able to allow us to do is start to build up and reassert uh, hospitals' ability to take in a large number of patients. Over the last several decades, hospital care has moved a lot of ways to outpatient care. The number of hospital beds decreased and folks went in and got out on the same day. COVID-19 doesn't work that way. And with the usual input of patients in in-bed facilities, a large influx of COVID-19 patients overwhelms the, uh, the healthcare system. Unfortunately, we've seen that in certain parts of the world and we're starting to see it here in the United States, especially in New York. Um, what it also did was, is gives us more time to learn about this disease, to get better data, to update our modeling and to update plans of attack. So slowing COVID-19 absolutely saves lives and building up that capacity in the hospitals gives us the time necessary to start moving this further down the road so we get closer to therapeutics that may work. You get better testing like antibody testing and eventually we get to a vaccine that will save lives. So I wanna just be very clear. I know these actions are painful. They're painful both social isolation wise, they are painful economically to many of you. The stress and the disruption you've been feeling is unprecedented. And I think it's very difficult when we don't see an end to it or we don't have a clear plan together. That's why Minnesota's taken a little different path. And it's why one that I wanna make sure, since we're all in this together, that everybody on this team understands what we're seeing, what the data shows, and what the plan of attack going forward is. So on March 25th, I issued Executive Order 2020, which is our stay at home order. You're following this. I still encourage people, uh, keep the social distancing. Don't let your guard down. As I said last time I addressed you, if we don't have things in place and we don't buy the time necessary and we let our guard down on social distancing, this thing will come roaring back. More than likely, it will come back for a second wave, but by that time, the plan is to have things in place to deal with that, to make sure that we treat those that are most ill and that we have things in place that let us identify who has already had this, who potentially has short-term or long-term immunity and ways that we can speed up our testing on, uh, in real time. So during the stay at home order, we are collecting that data. I wanna share some of that with you. We are increasing the number of ICU beds, ventilators, uh, personal protective equipment for the surge. I'm gonna talk about this later. This is not without challenges and this is not without roadblocks. Uh, but our job is not to complain about roadblocks. Our job is to breach those roadblocks or work around them. And that's exactly what we're doing in Minnesota. And then to develop strategies together to address the economic and social impacts, both in our current situation and what happens when we come out of stay at home orders and when we try and move back to something that resembles normalcy. So the data that I have in a website that we've created is a one-stop portal, if you will. We are going to continue to update it, but it will provide you the data that we are seeing that is informing us about how many gloves we have, how many masks we have, how many sicknesses we're having and where are they located. Trying to make sure that as you are part of this plan, you understand what your stay at home order means, you understand what preserving PPE means, and you understand when it's time to get to the hospital and what will be done once you get there. So I want to show you and spend just a bit of time on this 
This is our COVID dashboard. And, and once you get to the site, you can see it listed at the top. Um, there is an awful lot of information there. But what it will show you is just on this first front page is the cases that we have, the folks that have recovered, unfortunately, the fatalities that we've seen. And of course, our entire uh, mission here is to keep that number as low as possible. This site will also allow you, as I said, to be able to go on educational resources, um, uh, employment issues like unemployment insurance or workman's comp, and, and different resources about where you can and what you can do during our stay at home order. This next slide is one that we will continue to build out. And this is one that's of deep importance to all of us. If you see at the top is the testing, and, and there'll be time, and we'll talk some more about that at a later time. But as Minnesota starts to strategize of what long-term testing would look like and what the purpose of it is, um, we expect to start creating some of our homegrown ability to expand that. Ways that we can use the serology tests that should be able to help us predict some immunity, getting more folks back into the workforce and more folks back into normal life. Social distancing, just one metric that we have up here and we're using several on this is, is just typical traffic patterns so that you can see this. If we do this and we see that these things correlate directly with compressing that curve and pushing it out, that is allowing us the time to do what you see in the middle there on hospital surge capacity. And if some of this is too small on the screen, I just encourage you all to get on the site after we're done. This will be updated, as I said, daily so that you can keep an update just as we are. And what you start to see is the ICU beds. And I wanna point out in there where we talk about current ICU bed capacity and then 24 hour and 72 hour surge capacity. We're not just building these where they set empty, we're preparing for when the surge comes, which means we can operate as normally as possible in our hospitals, using the staff that we have as wisely as possible, preserving PPE when we need to, and at the same time being able to surge into those beds, both internally in the hospital situation and then alternate care facilities should we need those. And then you look at the ventilators, the ventilators being used, and then the procurement, which I'll talk a little bit in a while as we're starting to procure these uh, uh, essential materials that we're going to need. And then a list of the critical care supplies. And I want to just be candid with you, Minnesota. A lot of folks in, are not putting out this information because they're afraid it'll create a sense of panic. You can see on here, we need more of these things. We need to continue to get them. We need to have them produced. We need the supply chain to work. Um, it's, it's no uh, secret either that there's, uh, there's somewhat of a disconnect between the federal strategic stockpile and what the states have. My job as governor is to find a way to get these, and that's exactly what we're doing, um, both internally with our procurement specialists and then externally with some of the best companies in the world helping us do that. And then how we're being able to get this personal protective equipment out to people and how we are making sure that those, as we expand the need to have this, and I'm hearing you, Minnesota, um, if you're in a personal care setting, um, if you're a police officer or firefighter and you're responding to calls, um, if you're clerking at the grocery store, and I've noticed some have started to put up uh, plexiglass shields and, and doing that on their own. We need to work together on this because this is an area that's going to make the difference between life and death and protecting our first responders. Our child care capacity, and we've worked incredibly hard there so that first line responders can get out there, making sure their children are taken care of and uh, making sure that we're able to keep those child care providers safe and open, and then economic security. And I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, you're seeing the numbers, an unprecedented surge in unemployment claims, uh, an unprecedented uh, stress on our economy. And we are taking all of those into consideration as we protect human life and think about smart strategies to quickly and safely move us back so that we're able to do, go on with the economic activities that, that matter to us. So I'd like to respond to what we're doing here. And, and these are the work groups. You are buying us the time. So you have a, an expectation if you've given us that time, what is the time buying us? It was buying us that capacity to ramp up those materials you saw, to plan a response to this, to talk about recovery, and then where are the resources coming from? How are we managing state budgets? How are we working with our federal partners? And how are we building public-private partnerships, which I would say Thank you, Minnesotans, once again, for the recovery funds that have been set up, for the smart things that our nonprofits and our for-profit uh, corporations are working together to provide that. The state's job in many of this is to help align that, to make sure that those resources are being funneled in a coherent manner, all aimed at that point of 
keeping people from getting this. If you get it and need hospitalization, that care will be there for you. Because if that happens, the one thing we know that in this 90 days that we've seen uh, COVID-19 is, we have a much higher success rate of saving people if that's there. If it is not, we start to get where the system crashes. So I wanna talk about the working groups and some of the lines of attack and lanes of responsibility that we put on. You saw the hospital surge, partnering with the hospital to assess needs. This is unprecedented. Our hospital systems are independently well-run agencies, but they are internal to themselves. They order their own supplies. They have their own doctors. They have their own protocols on when to use these supplies. What we've been able to do in Minnesota, and this is planning that goes back many years, is to be able to coordinate together, to talk together. The supplies that you saw on the previous slide are supplies that the state stockpile has. Individual hospitals have those and we're able to see that. We're able to forecast when their burn rate is going through and the state can restock to them to making sure that we're moving where the needs are. Understanding that the state is not going to see the same needs at the same time but when they come, we can move to that. And I have to tell you, that comes to supporting this workforce. That's childcare, that's personal protective equipment. That's understanding that our frontline, um, especially medical workers, are under an incredible amount of stress. Supplies, this is the procurement I would say again. We put a top procurement officer in charge of that. We are working with some of the best people. I am on the phone multiple times daily um, with CEOs of corporations where they're able to say, we can get you 83 ventilators today. We're sending six over now. Here's the time frame, and we will have you your requested number by your peak surge date. Those are the things that we're working on. And as I said, um, this system, as you're seeing play out, is strained around the world. Um, we, we know that certain, uh, because of the supply chains that are in multinational uh, uh, companies, some are not allowing export of those materials and we need to work around those. My job and the job of my team here is, again, not to just say that there's a roadblock, to work around or breach the roadblock and we are doing that. Testing, working with hospitals to expand testing, working with the Abbott Labs. We're waiting, we were told two days ago we would get the uh, Abbott Labs, the quick 15 day test. We are still waiting on the, or excuse me, the 15 minute test. Um, we are supposed to get 15 of those units, we're waiting on those. That those types of things inform our strategy. One of our long-term strategies is working with places like the Mayo Clinic, who's working on serology tests, the antibody tests, is at some point in time, it's hoped that our, our goal is, is that we're able to test large numbers of people with the capacity in the state, not relying on anyone else, be able to tell who's immune, and then do the fast rapid test where we may be able to return certain institutions back to more of normalcy and be able to test on a regular basis, be able to do uh, temperature checks at the door, anything that gives us rapid response, rapid mitigation, rapid isolation while allowing a large number of people to continue to function. Uh, education and child care, again, we're working hard to make sure our children get the education. Um, I know this is challenging for them. I'm speaking to all of you right now. It breaks my heart. You're missing your classmates. You're missing your teachers. You're missing those things in the spring that are so important. I know there are athletes out there that were prepared to go and win state championships, that were prepared to compete on the fields and on the diamonds across Minnesota. Um, your sacrifice is keeping people safe. It will not be forgotten. And please know um, you're setting an example for us. Protecting people. This is that idea of isolating the most vulnerable. We are seeing like uh, every other state has seen that uh, the fatality rates of COVID-19 target the elderly and those with underlying conditions more than ever. They can strike at all ages. No one is immune. Healthy young people are getting this and becoming fatalities. But we know that the preponderance of the evidence shows that those congregate care facilities. So we're working incredibly hard on that. I wanna thank the Department of Health and, and folks working together um, to understand that in unprecedented times, we will protect people's privacy and civil liberties, but if there's a need to get information out of like where these facilities are, um, you deserve to have information. You deserve to be as well-versed as possible on the facts around COVID-19, the data that we are using to inform our decisions, 
and then the plan of attack so that you can be part of this. Food security is, is a deep concern. I just got off the phone with many of our major agriculture groups and agricultural producers. We are still seeing the supply chain is solid. There is food in the grocery stores. There is no need for people to stock up or overstock up. And those producers are already thinking about things like how do they get in the field? How is seed and fertilizer going to be delivered? What will harvest look like and how do we move those? And, and I remind everyone, um, our neighbors who are food insecure, we are coordinating closely with our food banks. We have brought on um, experts in this, Andrew Zimmern, uh, folks at, uh, at Hormel, folks who understand how this works together to make sure that every single Minnesotan has adequate food through this entire pandemic. And then economic security with the federal government to help provide for those folks, businesses, individuals who were laid off. And I want to be very clear, the state of Minnesota is doing this as well as any other states in getting out, especially uh, unemployment compensation. But I wanted to, uh, to let each and every one of you know how the people at the Department of Employment and Economic Development and how everybody in our administration views this. If we get 99 checks out in a timely manner and deposited in people's account, and we fail to get one out, that one family is so severely impacted, we cannot accept that. Um, and so while it may never be possible to be 100%, the goal in this administration is to do exactly that. And when folks are falling through the cracks, to go back and adjust. Working with our federal partners who delivered the CARES Act is a great start for us to get there and then implementing that. But I want folks out there to know, we hear you. We're not going to, and it is no time to say how great we're doing on unemployment insurance if someone's not getting it. How great we're doing if a small business owner has not been there, or if a farm doesn't have the capacity or the capital to be able to buy the seed for spring planting. So we'll continue to work the issue. Our partners in the legislature have been spectacular. Um, I, I oftentimes talk about one Minnesota and working together. We have healthy differences that create a vibrant discussion around how things should be done. But this group of people rallying around the people of Minnesota, suggesting good ideas with an expectation, and you as Minnesotans can expect this, if the data changes or new situations arise, we will change our course of action. We will change where we're at. We will never allow ideology to get in the way of facts. If the facts don't support the ideology, we're changing the ideology. And I think you're seeing a fairly rapid ability to go back and forth with legislators and our federal partners. We need to ensure funds are available quickly. It is an unprecedented time. If we need to step up security at our uh, corrections institutions, we need to move those resources quickly. The same with when I have the ability and these come up quickly and the chances disappear quickly, if I have the capacity to buy masks or ventilators, I need to do so immediately. And the legislature needs to know that there is a fully transparent way to manage where those funds are going, how the decisions are being made and reporting back to them. So I wanna thank them for um, both their leadership and their oversight capacity during this unprecedented time. I think it's important, Minnesotans, as you're watching across the country, um, to not sell false hope where it isn't there. Uh, plans matter. Preparations matter. But to understand, this is an unprecedented challenge. Challenges are arising, as we said, both from the capacity in our hospital beds. We still are learning about COVID-19. Um, there are promising uh, therapeutics on the horizon. We're hearing uh, different things that are being tested but it takes time. And those challenges are still because of not having the full picture, the lack of data. And I wanna mention, no model is, uh, is perfect. And you're seeing many of them out there. I'm doing the research too. I'm asking why um, the, the one in London looks different than the one in Washington State that looks different in Minnesota. Our goal was is to personalize it as, as quickly as we could, understanding we have a short data set to go into that. So the parameters and the ability to have a, a sense of confidence is pretty wide. But the one thing I can tell you, every single model shows replicable trends. We know what happens if we don't get social distancing. We know what happens if you are not able to get ICU care when you need it. Those things are known. So we continue to refine those models. We continue to look at them. We continue to try and make realistic expectations because I can tell you right now, states that are requesting 10,000 ventilators 
are not going to get them because they're not there. So we need to figure out how do we make sure that we're moving what we have around, that we're increasing the capacity to the absolute limit that we can, and that we're being innovative in reducing the numbers or the ability to get people the care they need. So states are competing against states right now. That's no secret either. Countries are competing against other countries. We are doing everything possible to make sure that Minnesotans are taken care of without compromising our ethics to our neighbors across this country and across the globe. There are ways that we can do this if we strategically plan, if we think together and we think about once a wave has passed somewhere, I think the expectation is, is that those states will then be able to help others. So uh, as this goes forward, there are going to be more of these come up, but Minnesotans have taken these on before. We are not simply going to accept that this is what COVID-19 does. There are things that the virus will do and there is a science that shows us where it's happening, but the science is also on our side of finding things we can do against it. The ability to think coherently, to think together, and to move against this is one of the advantages that we have. So the danger is still here. The numbers, and I, I want to make sure I tell everyone this, the peak will come to Minnesota. We are still early out. You have made it possible to push it out further, which has gained valuable time, but it will come. It will most likely come before we have a lot of the therapeutics we need, or certainly before we have a vaccine. But when it comes to Minnesota, our intention is, is to make sure every single one of you gets all of the care that we can possibly provide you. And that we continue to use data to keep us separated long enough to make sure fewer of us get, uh, get infected. So we've got a lot of work to do yet, Minnesota. We've got a plan that gets us through this time, that prepares us for the peak, and then also looks at being a state that can recover as quickly as possible, both from a health standpoint and from an economic standpoint to get us driving forward. All of those things happen because this is a state that has built resiliency into its system. It's a state that is well known for our medical expertise and that medical infrastructure. And above all else, this is where character starts to get um, defined. The ability to say, I will sacrifice in the short run to make sure that my neighbors and my family stay safe. I will follow the rules to make sure that we can get there and I will continue to keep myself informed so that the spread of misinformation or new ideas that we may be getting missed are able to be shared in a coherent manner. So Minnesota, I look forward to talking with you more. I look forward for the side when we're, we're done with COVID-19 and we've learned an awful lot about ourselves on the strength of this state. So as one Minnesota, We'll get through this. Thank you.